Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this joint service of Grace Church, Sandbach, and Wheelock Heath Baptist Church. If you're new here, my name's Tim. I'm one of the leaders here at Wheelock Heath Baptist Church, and it's great uh, to have you all with us. Uh, Welcome to those of you watching at home as well. We hope you're well, and I hope you feel uh, a part of what we're doing here. Uh, Paul's going to be speaking later on, on Psalm 103. Um, And so I'm going to read a brief part of uh, that to start our service this morning. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to step on Paul's toes. But as David starts this psalm, he gives himself some reasons why he should praise. He's saying, praise the Lord my soul. He's telling himself he needs to pray. Uh, And it'd be good for us to think about these things because sometimes when we come to worship, maybe we're a bit drowsy at the six o'clock service, perhaps, because we've had a, a, a long, slow day or we've maybe had people round and... Um, we've maybe not got our head in the right place. Well, here are some good reasons why we should be praising the name of the Lord this evening. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins, all your sins, and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. What great reasons we have to sing the praise of our God uh, this evening. So let's stand and sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul.
Well, it's good when we uh, get to come together as two churches to be able uh, to pray for one another. So I'm going to try to uh, pray uh, relevantly to uh, both churches. I uh, was on a, a Zoom call with uh, Park Church and Hope Church uh, this afternoon. Uh, so that's Simon Maudsley's new church uh, that's been planted out. Not that it's his church, but you know Simon Maudsley. You don't know anyone else who's there. Um, and it's quite encouraging to think about how they are at the start of their journey and, and we're not at the end of ours, certainly, but uh, a little further on the journey. And remembering all that uncertainty uh, that we had when we first planted uh, Grace Church and how much we have to give thanks to God for in the way that he's been at work through our two churches in the interim. So let's remember to give thanks. Um, we'll pray for some other matters as well. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who gives us 10,000 reasons and uh, an ever more amount to praise your name. Lord, we thank you that we have a glorious good news to be able to take to the world around us. Father, we thank you um, that we can proclaim that all our sins are forgiven. We can proclaim that to the very worst person, a person who has committed the most shameful deeds. We can preach it to one another. Uh, when we feel overwhelmed by our sin, we can preach it to ourselves to remind us to be humble and dependent on you. We thank you too, Father, that we will be praising you forevermore for all your plentiful goodness and joy that you will grant us day after day for all eternity. Lord, when we speak of what is done in our two churches, we're, we're not just talking of some uh, notices, as it were, in a, in a country club. No, oh, Lord, we're talking of the things that you are at work in in our churches. And so although we'll be thinking of, of matters, of uh, events that are happening, Lord, we do remember most of all the way that you're working in people's hearts. And we thank you that there are a number of people in, in both churches who are coming under the sound of your gospel. Uh, we thank you for the many that were there uh, yesterday morning and uh, that will have been there in the Christmas period. We thank you for the good news that we do have to be able to proclaim to those around us. And we pray that more might come in and that Christians would grow in their understanding of that gospel good news. Father, I do thank you for Grace Church Sandbach. I thank you uh, for the progress that's being made um, towards the um, getting a charitable status. Such a mundane thing in many ways, Father, but we know that it, it will mean a greater flexibility uh, and uh, strength for uh, the future. And so we do pray for the deacons and the elders in putting that together. Uh, we thank you too, Father, for the opportunities upcoming to uh, reach out to the community. We thank you for the buzz events. We thank you um, for the opportunities that have been had there to build relationships with people from Sandbach. Uh, we pray, Father, that in those conversations, in the word that is spoken, that the difference of the message the Lord Jesus brings might speak uh, to some who come to hear. Father, we uh, thank you too uh, for the opportunity of the Christians uh, Against Poverty course that's coming, the Cat Money course. Father, we thank you for the ability to be able to help people in, in difficult circumstances. Uh, we thank you for uh, the opportunities that have been had in, in supporting people in our community in the past and, and also in being able to point them beyond the, the temporal um, financial needs of the moment to be able to encourage them to investigate the spiritual riches that are ours in Christ. I pray that would continue to be the case and we pray uh, that you'd be at work in the hearts of those who need to take part to come and join. Father, we um, thank you too for all that's been going on in the church here. And uh, we thank you once again. We, we don't take it for granted that we're able to be open, that we're able to have people coming to all sorts of groups during the week, um, babies, children, young people, mums and dads, uh, and the whole congregation, of course, on a Sunday. We thank you for this blessing. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, in those opportunities that are given, there'd be real um, life change that would affect for all eternity. 
Father, we do um, thank you for um, the opportunity to do uh, Christianity Explored in our, our small groups. We thank you for the equipping that that provides us with. We do thank you, too, for a, a number of individuals who are uh, reading the Bible with, with friends at this moment, helping people to investigate the claims of Christianity. Uh, Lord, we pray that for those who have questions, you would uh, provide the answers, that your spirit would open the eyes of their heart, that they might see uh, the truth. And Father God, we do uh, pray for ourselves in, in both congregations. Lord, would you be building us up under the preaching of your word? Would you be growing us not just intellectually, but spiritually, that our love for you might increase, that our confidence in you uh, might increase? And we pray that for this evening, Father. We thank you for the message that Paul has prepared for us. And we pray that as we uh, come to hear it, you would give us open ears and open hearts so that we will know exactly what you are speaking to each of us. And Lord, as we gather around the Lord's table later on, and we remember that we are partakers in the body and blood of Christ, uh, we pray that we would have our souls lifted from uh, the burden of sin and remember the great wedding supper of a lamb that is to come. Uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, uh, I believe Chris is going to come and read uh, Psalm 103, and then uh, Paul's going to come straight afterwards. Thanks, Chris. The reading this evening is Psalm 103, Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins, heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. Good evening, good evening everyone. Good to see you, good to be with you, and to worship God uh, together. Uh, let me begin with a question. How good is your memory? How good is your memory? Don't worry, I'm not going to give you a, a test on that. But particularly, how good is your spiritual memory? Are you prone to forgetfulness? Are you prone to forget being forgetful about the things that matter most? Do you uh, wake up? Uh, in the morning? Do you ever wake up in the morning 
and um, get your phone out and look at your phone and uh, get ready for work or get ready for school. And then you realize you're there, you're at work or your school and you've not given a thought to the Lord. I'm not looking down on you. I've been there as well. Do you ever find yourself uh, facing challenges uh, in life and you're, you're worrying? You're worrying about these things. Maybe you're, you panic uh, when something happens that you weren't expecting and you forget to think about the Lord. Do you forget what difference he might make to your perspective? How good is your memory? Well, this great psalm uh, was written by King David, as we see in a little bit at the top. Uh, and David was not a super saint. Uh, he was a great king, uh, but he sinned just like we do, and he had a tendency to forget uh, just like we do. Uh, he had a, a tendency to focus on himself rather than looking up to God. We know that because that's the case for all of us. We all have that tendency. And so in this psalm, he preaches to himself. Uh, he urges himself to remember what God is like. So what is God like? Well, in the last several psalms, uh, a big theme has been the encouragement that the Lord reigns as king over his world. Uh, so if you flick back uh, briefly at the starts of Psalm 93 or 97 or 99, if you only find one of them, it's the same start. They all start with the line, the Lord reigns. Uh, God's kingship, uh, God's lordship, his, his kingdom it is a big biblical theme. But what kind of king is this Lord, the Lord who reigns? And in Psalm 103, uh, King David paints a portrait of the God who reigns uh, for us to feast our eyes on uh, this evening. Uh, so let's start in verses 1 uh, to 5 as David speaks to his own soul. And uh, the heart of this section uh, is David's message to himself, my soul Praise and remember. That's our first big heading this evening. My soul, praise and remember. Uh, verse one, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Now, how personal that is. He's speaking at his own soul, every part of him. Uh, it's the opposite of kind of just going through the motions and ticking off the boxes and doing his quiet time and then that's done. Uh, rather, this is about the bottom of his heart, the depths of his being, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. So where will such heartfelt praise, where will that come from? Well, verse two, praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. It is a call to remember. And that, of course, is what we do as we come to the Lord's Supper. Uh, we remember the Lord Jesus. And how easily we do forget, don't we, in practice. We know the, the truths in our minds, most of us, but in practice, our days are taken over by our busyness, uh, by, by stress, by anxiety, how easily we forget. Maybe for most of us in this room, the, this psalm is very familiar. Maybe there's not going to be things in this psalm that we've not heard uh, before, but how easily we forget in the sense of losing our focus. We can forget in times of trial when everything seems so overwhelming. And perhaps, especially in the opposite situation, we can easily forget when actually everything seems to be going rather well. Very interesting little passage in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that, <clears throat> excuse me, that makes this point really strikingly. Uh, Deuteronomy 8 verse uh, 10, Moses uh, speaking or God speaking uh, through Moses to the people. And he says, when you have eaten and, been, and are satisfied, this is as they go into the promised land, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God 
at failing to observe his commands, his laws and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, and when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and and you have and all uh, you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I take it it wasn't that, that Moses was saying that they would forget the facts, but rather their lives would be so taken over by all these good things they had, maybe for some of us many good things that we have, and they would in their hearts forget the Lord. How easy it is to forget our God when it seems like we've got everything that we need. Do you find that? In your prayer life, is it sometimes weaker when you're feeling most comfortable with how life is going compared to when you feel desperate and maybe then you really do cry out to God? Well, David knows this danger. And therefore, he he knows it's a danger for him, and so he preaches to his own soul. I wonder, do you do that? Do you preach uh, to your own soul? That is, remind yourself, my soul, praise the Lord. Uh, My soul, remember everything that he's given you in the Lord Jesus. See, the thing is, that idea of of preaching to ourselves is not just a Christian thing. Uh, The world does it too, and sometimes the world does it very well. For example, uh, a website on mindfulness uh, looks up and it it has a list of uh, 10 uh, mantras uh, that mindfulness experts apparently uh, live by or claim to live by. And here are some of those 10 uh, things, uh, things that they should preach to themselves Uh, Focus on the present. Uh, Remember your potential. Trust your gut. You are enough. Listen to your soul. And of course, we hear those kinds of things all the time, don't we? And that's why we need to actively replace those things actively take time to preach to ourselves the real truth that we find in God's words. Instead of focusing on the present, looking back to the cross and forward to the new creation. Instead of remembering my potential, remembering Jesus' death. Instead of trusting my gut, trusting his unfailing promises. Instead of, you are enough, Christ is enough. Instead of listening to your own soul, preaching to your soul and listening to God's words. Lots of voices all around us, preaching to us. What are you preaching to yourself? Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That is what we are particularly to remember, to not forget all the benefits that come from being in Christ. Uh, So what benefits does David call on his soul to remember? Number one, don't forget that God forgives all your sins. Uh, Not just some of them, not just the the smaller sins that you think, well, maybe I could forgive myself for, for that. No, all of them including perhaps that one that comes into your mind when you pause. You think about your sin. That sin, Jesus has paid for it and every other sin on the cross. And he called out, it is finished. Number two, don't forget that God heals all your diseases. Uh, what What a thought that is for us, especially if we've perhaps experienced at serious illness, or if we've been deeply affected by the illness that loved ones have gone through. And, you know, this goes hand in hand with the forgiveness of sins, because 
the Bible is clear that death has come into the world as a result of sin. Uh, Romans 5 uh, verse 12, it tells us that sin entered the world through the one man, that's Adam, and death through sin. So sin enters the world and as a result death also enters the world. And therefore, if all of our sins are forgiven, then all our diseases will one day be healed as well. And don't we see a a glorious preview of that as we read the Gospels? Jesus uh, breaking the power of sickness, uh, breaking the power of death as he heals those who are ill with just a word, as he speaks and Lazarus comes out of the grave, he breathes new life into a stone-cold dead body. And in the new heavens and the new earth, uh, that healing will be perfect and complete. Every disease, every physical disease, every mental illness, Whatever it is, whatever it is that makes your life right now so tough, on that day to come, you will be completely healed. As we were seeing earlier, for 10,000 years and then forevermore. Number three, don't forget that God redeems your life from the pit. I remember when, um, when I was young, climbing up at Scarfell Pike uh, with my family, and um, sometimes the, the, the route would take us on a, on a path, stony little path, sometimes relatively narrow. And on one side of it, there was almost a, a sheer drop. You didn't want to lose your footing. Well, the picture in verse four is sort of of losing your footing, uh, falling into a chasm. No way you could ever climb out of it. Well, if you're a Christian, do you remember when you were in the pit? When you were in the pit of your sin, when you were heading headlong towards hell. You and I were in that pit of the grave spiritually. We were heading towards that pit of hell. And so when you feel like you've really done it now, that's really it. You've fallen back into that pit again. What do we do? We remember redemption. We don't forget the God who redeemed us from the pit. 1 Peter chapter 1, you have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. Don't forget he has redeemed your life from the pit. At number four, don't forget that God crowns you with love and compassion. Uh, Last night, we watched the um, film together, uh, The King's Speech. Uh, I've mentioned it before. Some of you might remember I've done that. But um, Colin Firth plays the the main role. He plays King George V. And um, when he becomes the king, of course, the crown is placed on his head. Uh, And you expect that. You expect a a crown to be worn by a king. But do do you expect the king to put the crowns on the heads of his subjects? Well, that is what the king of kings does for us. A crown. What a thing for the holy creator, Lord of all, to give to a sinner like David or like me or you. And what a crown to give us. He crowns us with love and compassion. And as we look at the Gospels, we see Jesus's love and compassion all over them, don't we? And then number five, don't forget that God satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. There's lots of things that we desire. There's lots of things that we would love to have. And when we look to fulfill those desires anywhere other than in the Lord Jesus, well, they always let us down. In the end, they always let us down. But our deepest desires, the things we most need, they can be satisfied in the Lord Jesus. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. What a lovely uh, metaphor that is. A picture, uh, an eagle in your mind. 
Picture it in, in full flight. Picture its strength, its majestic power. Well, we have a God who, when we are weak, he loves to renew our strength. And he loves to remind our soul of all the benefits uh, that lead us back to joyful praise uh, for him. What blessings these are in those opening verses. Remind yourself of them. Remind yourself of those things because the world won't remind you of them. And therefore, we need to actively bring them to mind, actively encourage one another and bring them to one another's minds. And praise the Lord, as David does, for these amazing blessings. How right it is that we should give praise to him for these vast benefits that he's lavished on us. And then from those Five little snapshots in those opening verses. David now focuses in more closely on the theme of God's covenant love. And so let's look, secondly, our second major point. Remember his vast covenant love. Remember his vast covenant love. Uh, David's words in verses 1 to 5 have been very personal, preaching to his own soul, but now it, it floods uh, now it flows out to how God is with how God is with all of His people, uh, with everyone who belongs to Him. Uh, verse six: an encouragement when we feel weighed down, which we so often do, that God's justice will put all things right in the end. And then verse seven it takes us to the days of Moses. He made known His ways to Moses. Uh, his deeds to the people of Israel. What specifically did God make known to Moses? I think here uh, David has in mind, particularly when uh, Moses uh, um, asks God to show him his glory. He wants God to show him uh, his great glory. Uh, And what does God uh, show to him? Moses cannot see with his eyes God's glory. That would be too much for him. So God speaks and describes his glory. And it's all about his character. Exodus 34, verse 6. And uh, the Lord passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebelliousness and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for their sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. For us, we can remember and we do remember as we come to the Lord's table that at the cross, Jesus pays for all the sin. But just like uh, some of the words in that psalm, uh, sorry, in um, in Exodus, David here is pretty much quoting part of that, uh, what God said in Exodus. The Lord, uh, verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Now notice um, it's the, the Lord in capital letters here. It is Yahweh, his personal name, God's covenant name speaks of his covenant commitment to his people. And do you remember the context uh, where God uh, revealed himself, spoke those words to Moses uh, in the book of Exodus? Do you remember what happened just two chapters uh, before that? Uh, God has just made the covenant uh, with the people. And what do they do? The Israelites uh, take uh, their gold, they bring all their gold together, they throw it in uh, to the pile together, and they make a statue of a calf, and they bow down uh, to that and worship it. And what is God? What kind of God is there for a people who treat God like that? Well, David reminds us in verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding. In love. When we are burdened, when we feel the weight of our sin, 
Or indeed, when we realise that we've not felt the weight of our sin and we think, oh, what am I like? I've sinned in all these ways and I haven't even felt the burden of it. Look at God's character. Look at the kind of God that he is. Not compassionate to righteous people who've got it all sorted, compassionate to sinners. Gracious to sinners. Slow to anger at sinners. Abounding in love for sinners. In fact, in the ESV, the, the translation is abounding in steadfast love. The translation of that Hebrew word chesed that we often see in the book of Psalms and elsewhere. God's tenacious and kind and fully committed covenant love towards his children. And of course, we see the character of God, his great kindness, most of all in uh, the Lord Jesus, don't we? This is how Jesus treated people, isn't it? Think of how Jesus treated the leper, his compassion. Think of how Jesus treated the woman at the well with all the mess in her life. Think of how he treated her. Think of how he treated Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus on that day of great sorrow for them. Think how he treated even the rich young ruler with all his pride. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Compassionate to sinners, gracious to sinners, slow to anger at sinners, abounding in chesed love for sinners. Verse 9, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. I wonder whether um, you probably never say this out loud. I wonder if the thought ever crosses your mind that God has been a little bit unfair to you. Do you ever feel that you deserve something a bit better than what God has given you? Well, praise God that he does not treat us as we deserve. Verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Again, the word uh, translated love here is the word chesed, God's steadfast love, his abundant kindness, his faithful covenant love for his people. How great is that love? It is as high as the heavens are above the earth. Now, science and technology do marvellous things. They've taken men into space even 50 years back. Uh, they've sent rockets a long way off, but they've never got anywhere close to sending a human being to the edge of our galaxy, uh, or even the edge of our solar system, let alone the edge of our galaxy or the edge of the universe. Now, of course, it's only a metaphor, but uh, the point is a little bit like this. Think of the, the greatest distance that you can imagine. You can't imagine the end edge of the universe, but think of the biggest distance that you can imagine. And know that God's covenant love for you is infinitely vaster still. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions uh, from us. That's what we think as we come, think about as we come to the Lord's table, isn't it? At the cross, our transgressions, our sins, uh, as far as the east is from the west, removed from us. How do we think about that metaphor? Well, think about how big the earth is, the circumference of the earth, 25,000 miles thereabouts. You know, if you were to run 10 miles a day, starting today, and if you were to start running round the earth, and even if there was no mountains in the way and no seas, and you could just go in a nice uh, straight route all the way round, you'd get back home towards the end of 2028. Point is, our sins are gone, so far gone, they could never, ever come back uh, to haunt us again. Ultimately, his grace is shown in a better covenant than that covenant with Moses. The new covenant. Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. The night Jesus was betrayed, 
What does he say to his disciples? He knows where he's going the next day. Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this so that you will not forget. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. How easily we forget, how easily we go through the day and we've not thought about him. Come to the cross this evening and remember. Come to the cross each morning and remember. Remember his vast covenant love. And then thirdly, remember his never failing compassion. Remember his never failing compassion. Do you sometimes feel that you really are in need of compassion? Do you you ever feel that people have treated you maybe in in a cold way, in a clinical way, but no one has made the effort to really climb into your shoes? Well, how different is the Lord? He has climbed into your shoes by coming down and living among us and going to the cross for us. He couldn't have done it any better. Compassion has already appeared in both the sections that we've looked at in the psalm, but now in verses 13 to 18, it is the central theme. Uh, Verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He is, of course, the perfect father. But what does an average father do when he sees his child sobbing? He, He runs to her. He wants to comfort her. He puts her gently on his knee. He has compassion on her. And if he does that, then how much more does God have compassion on his children, on you and on me? On those who fear him. What does that mean? What does it mean to to fear him? I mean, for the the person who's not yet a Christian, they they should be fearful in the sense of terrified. And if you've not yet put your trust in Jesus, you should be terrified at this God being your judge. But if you're a Christian, you don't need to be terrified anymore. So what does it mean? Not that a, a father like this would ever disown us, would ever cast us out again. But rather a, a father who is so good, so abounding in love, unlike anything we've ever known, so perfect and so good in every way, he makes us tremble with a trembling joy as we approach a God like him. How do we see his compassion? Verse 14, he knows. He remembers. He never forgets. And what does he remember? He remembers that we came from dust. Genesis chapter 2, he remembers that we are fragile. He remembers that just as we came from the dust, because of our sin, we will return to the dust. He remembers that we're like grass, we're like flowers in a field. We we see the seasons, don't we? We, Maybe last spring you were out on a walk and you saw beautiful colours of the fields and the flowers growing and all their beauty and their their majesty flourishing in their splendour. But then if you go back to the same place tomorrow, you won't see those flowers there. None of them will still be alive. God remembers that we're just like that too. COVID has brought that back into our minds in many ways if we'd been tempted before to forget it. But God doesn't forget. God always remembers and God has compassion. Verse 16, uh, what becomes of the rose and the, the poppies? Its place remembers it no more. And it would be just the same for us, wouldn't it? How much do we remember about our great, great, great grandparents? Maybe a name, maybe some detail in a in a a record somewhere, possibly we know nothing about them whatsoever. And it'd be just like that for us. 
Who would remember you or me in the year 2300 or whatever? Well, no one would. We would be forgotten. But not by God. Verse 17. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. Human relationships, if they last as far as the grave, they don't last further than the grave. But the Lord's love, his chesed love, his never giving up covenant love, it is forever. But is there a condition? Verse 17, again, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenants and who remember to obey his precepts. Is that the small print, David? Is that the the terms and conditions that David wished that hopes that maybe we're not going to notice? Well, David lived in the time of the old covenants. But what do we see in the new covenants? We see our covenant head, the Lord Jesus, who obeyed perfectly, who obeyed all the way to the cross. That is how, uh, that is how far his compassion reaches. And so we eat and we drink at his table to remember the new covenant in his blood. His blood that was poured out for those, for me, for you, who have not obeyed. We have a covenant keeper who obeyed for us and he imputed his covenant keeping, precept obeying righteousness to us. And so when we feel our great weakness, when we feel afraid When we feel our fragility, when we feel our closeness to the grave, we can know for sure if our God loves us this much, if he has shown us such compassion that took him to the cross for us, then his compassion for us will never fail. He will never, no, never, no, never forsake us. And because he died, because he removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, we can be sure of the Lord's love for us. We can be sure it will not come to an end when we die. His love will remain right with us all the way through that day and on from everlasting to everlasting. What a God we have. And so after David has remembered and preached to his soul all these glorious truths about God, it's no wonder, is it, that he calls on us to respond with joyful, thankful praise. That's 19 to 22. Everyone and everything, praise the king. Everyone and everything, including all of us, praise the king. Verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. God's covenant blessings and God's kingdom, they go hand in hand. Remember the um, uh, psalm is a psalm of David. Who is David? David is the king and he's the king who points forward to the even greater king, uh, the king of Psalm 2, if you know the psalm, Psalm 2, where it speaks about the king who God is going to send to rule over all of the nations. That's Jesus. How good it is to be ruled by the God of Psalm 103, the God who is like what we've been seeing. How good it is to be ruled by the God of the cross. How good it is Uh, that the king uh, that we exist to serve is this king. How good it is that the king, uh, the Messiah, Christ Jesus, has come into the world for us, for sinners. How good it is to see this king in action in the Gospels, embodying that compassion and chesed love, in the way that he treated all those he came into contact with. 
how good it is that this king went to the cross to secure our forgiveness, to secure our life that the grave can never take away from us. How good it is that this king now sits enthroned, uh, taking his seat next to God the Father, reigning over the entire universe with justice and compassion. How good that is. How good it is that the Lord reigns. And so that call to praise, but no longer just a call to his own soul, all of the angels, all of the heavenly beings, Uh, Verse 22, all his works, uh, which refers to everything that God has made, the whole creation, you and me, praise the Lord, my soul. Praise him, brothers and sisters. Praise him and forget not all his benefits. Let's remember Christ as we sing now and then again afterwards as we come uh, to the table. We're going to sing though now uh, that psalm, Psalm 103. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Have a seat.